Ikuzo means let's go. And in this episode, we'll go back to the time when giant reptiles roam the earth, rule the skies, and terrorize the oceans to the dinosaurs' reign. Both kids and grown ups have been fascinated by them, and some of those kids grew up to live the dream many of us had to become paleontologists like our guest today. Venturing through countries, deserts, forests, and shores to find those exceptional creatures and metaphorically bring, bring them back to life. Ladies and gentlemen, paleontologists at University of Utah and Natural History Museum of Utah, Mark Lowen. Mark, are you ready to go genuine, unscripted, and uncensored with us today? It's a pleasure to be with you. I always love talking about dinosaurs. Yeah, we, we too. <laughs> <laughs> And watching dinosaur movies, even better. Yeah, <laughs> and even better. I remember the first time I saw fossils uh, in Natural History Museum of Vienna. My dream profession was a paleontology, and something changed in the meantime, but my love for dinosaurs never ceased. But why did you become a paleontologist? Was it a childhood dream or just a profession? And what is the best part of being a paleontologist? So in the 70s, I had an awesome one of these small books and you open it up and it shows a child sitting inside the footprint of a giant long neck dinosaur. Mm. So from that moment, I knew that I wanted to become a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> My backup plan was to be a fire truck, uh, but neither of those worked out. I was yeah. not able to actually be <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. I'm still working on that. Yeah. Um, or a fire truck. So I actually went into science and I became a chemist. And in order to get into graduate school, I needed to do some summer research. So I fell into some summer research doing CSI work on dead turtles from the Eocene 50 million years ago. So we would try to figure out exactly what was killing these millions of turtles in southern Wyoming. And through that, I decided to change my focus of study and become a geologist. So I started studying ancient lakes and started looking at ecosystems. And that led me to the University of Utah when I actually started looking at the biology of dinosaurs. I got lucky coming to the University of Utah. We have an amazing collection of fossils that have been collected before. And using those, I was able to actually really start a new field within my studies, looking at these amazing and wonderful beasts. Mm, yeah, uh, you, 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 you mentioned their fossils and how you have a great collection of fossils. Uh, and Peter mentioned he, uh, he saw them and I had the chance to see some in, uh, in New York when I was. Uh, what fascinates me about fossils is, you know, these are old, 60 plus million years, some of them. Uh, I mean, the civilization is all like 12, 13,000 years. Uh, how is it to work with these, you know, things that carry 60 plus million years of history with them? Are you kind of humble? Because I, I honestly feel humbled when I know, damn it, this place is so old. This is crazy. You know, what is the feeling around that? Or it, did it become just a job for you? No, it's definitely humbling. <clears throat> and to be honest, uh, some people ask me, you know, why are you a paleontologist? <clears throat> Selfishly, it's in order to time travel. Yeah. First, for me, it was looking at rocks. You know, we would drive by the rocks that are cut on the side of the road as a road goes through a hill. And I'd look at those rocks and I'd wonder what it was like when those rocks were laid down. And through working into, into sedimentology, um, you actually can look at a road cut and think about what it looked like at X time in the past. And then the obvious question after that is if you can imagine that this looks like the swamps of Louisiana around the Mississippi River Delta, then the question is what's living here? What were they like? How do they interact with their peers? And for me, it's just wonderful to see a bone, 
recognize how the bone goes together into a skull, go from a skull to putting the soft tissue on the skull and figuring out what the animal would look like. And eventually, you know, you can end up with a fleshed out animal. Sometimes we're more right than others. But eventually, then the question is, how did this animal interact with the other animals it lived with in its mm. ecosystem? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's a short question. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I wanted to know. I know how we can guess what, how old is the fossil. How we get the other answer? Their, uh, their habitat, uh, relationships, were they in herd or uh, individuals? Uh, how do we get this answer? Uh, answers? Are there speculations or sometimes or, or we logically connect them with uh, animals of uh, we see today? So we have two methods that we use. We have one method that's called the extant phylogenetic bracket method. And in that, we take living relatives of dead animals and make inferences about what they're like. So literally for me, during my PhD, I studied how specifically the dinosaur Allosaurus grows up. And Allosaurus is this dinosaur behind me on the wall. Yeah, so we know what it looks like, yeah. It's a, you know, this is a middle-aged animal, probably mm -hmm. about 17, 18 years old. Wow. Um, I was looking at how they grew up from two years old to maybe 28 years old. And looking at that, I was looking at changes in the bones. And then I started to realize that scars on the bones actually represent muscles. Mm -hmm. So I helped dissect the hind leg of an ostrich. I looked at dissections of chickens and alligators and things like that. So we can pretty confidently, very confidently say what muscle is going where on a dinosaur. It's inference, but the scars are there. It's really good evidence. Then you can talk about and start to build models of how these muscles would move the animal. So people have made computer models in which they're looking at the muscles and they're able to say, like for instance, one of my colleagues can tell you that it's impossible for T-Rex to go 35 miles an hour like it does in Jurassic Park. <laughs> Physically, it doesn't have enough muscle mass in its leg to actually do that. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually you can get even farther up into what we call the pyramid of inference. And so you have the actual bones. You can infer soft tissues. Then you can infer movement. And then once you can infer movement, maybe you can infer behavior. And then very at the top of the pyramid, you can infer interactions with other species hmm. uh, let me let me just stop this podcast right here and say this is what the fucking biology class should have looked like <laughs> you came ready with the with the skulls and everything and explaining it great uh, yeah this is what the biology class really should have been hey we try so at the university of utah i teach two classes hmm. one of those is world of dinosaurs in which we really learn a lot about dinosaurs. And the other one is science and cinema, where, you know, we basically punk bad movies <laughs> to figure out what the science is behind them, what's right, what's wrong, and learn a little bit along the way. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> well, when I first saw those fossils, those bones of the dinosaurs, I couldn't hold up. I, I had to touch them in the museum and everything started beeping, but it was worth it. And you have more, uh, more chances than that. You have the chance to name them. And you were in the team that named uh, Cosmoceratops, am I right? And Cosmoceratops, yes. Yeah, yeah. And how does it feel to name the dinosaur? This is like the baby. Or... And that was a cool name. How did you come up with such yeah, a cool name? Of course. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Cosmo is kind of a two-faced god, mm -hmm. and so when we found it, it was one of the first, there are two families of ceratopsians like Triceratops. 
there is one family that we call the centrosaurs, and then there's another family that we call the chasmosaurs. Triceratops is one of these chasmosaurs. And Cosmoceratops belongs to the Triceratops line. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, it's curled over horns on the top of its frill actually belong, look more like this other group over here. Mm, yeah. So we called it kind of two-faced because it's pretending to be like something it isn't. Yeah, it's in both. We've learned a little bit more since, but yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's definitely cool. So we try to find a cool name. Um, another one I named um, that I'm super proud of the name is a dinosaur called Lythernax. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's an ancestor to T. Rex, but its name, you know, we went back to the ancient Greek to find descriptors of this animal, and we found words for the king of gore. Mm -hmm. So you know, its name actually means gore king mm -hmm. for the king of gore. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we try to be clever a little bit. Yeah, uh, let me ask you this: you 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 were talking about. Uh, uh, your research findings that you did uh, uh, in Utah and uh, places, uh, deltas of the rivers. Uh, but dinosaurs have been, remains of the dinosaurs have been found on all seven continents. Uh, have you maybe had the chance to do a research in uh, here in Europe or maybe Asia or South America? Did you travel and uh, you did the research? Yeah, so I've actually, um, I haven't been to South America yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have dug for dinosaurs in Africa mm -hmm. and Madagascar. Nice. And then I do research all over the world. I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point in my career where I don't have time to do field work. I leave that to some of the young, younger guys. Um, so most of my work right now is in museums with actual bones. Mm -hmm. So if I find a dinosaur today in North America, it's going to take me a week or so to figure out whether I want to dig it up. Mm. Is it complete? Is it just one bone? If it is, then I have to ask permission from the government to make a large excavation. So it's probably not going to be until next summer that I actually dig it up. Mm. And depending on the size of the dinosaurs, it can take anywhere from three weeks to a month or longer to actually excavate it onto the ground. And then if the bones are big, I have to helicopter them to a truck. So it may take a couple more months to get that back to the museum. Once it's at the museum, it can take up to three years to painstakingly prepare all of the dirt away from the skeleton. So, that dinosaur Lythronax that I described in 2013 was actually found in 2008. So a lot of that is pre preparation. And then we had to run around the world looking at closely related animals. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a lot of museum research. Um, I'm supporting field programs as they take things out of the ground. Um, but right now I'm looking at, at dinosaurs down on the other end once they're actually prepared and we can study them. And is the field work uh, like we saw Alan Grant in Jurassic Park or just? <laughs> <laughs> Almost never, right? <laughs> I, I've been in one quarry where you could use a paintbrush to slowly paint away the sand. Yeah. It was this amazing white sand quarry with white bone in Madagascar. But other than that, it's usually a hammer and a chisel or a circular concrete cutoff saw or a gas powered jackhammer that we're using. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I wasn't thinking about it, but uh, I mean, uh, it, it should be hard to break around the, the actual fossil, not just yeah. brush it away. <laughs> but, and, and sometimes the fossil is really soft. Mm, yeah. And it's basically in concrete. Mm, yeah. So, how do you get that concrete off without breaking the fossil as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the tools go from all the way from giant jackhammers that one person is holding like this <laughs> down to many, many, many jackhammers with like a tungsten carbide tip that's like a needle jackhammer. Mm -hmm. And then they're taking grain by grain by grain away. Mm -hmm. And those, those people are amazing. 
you know, we have an army of volunteers at the museum um, and professional preparators, and they do a great job. I don't have the patience for that. Um, yeah, you don't want me preparing something because I want to figure out the things that I want to figure out. <laughs> Yeah. And so I may not actually prepare it in the right way to preserve it for the future. Yeah. yeah. And it's not always bones, it's tissue, it's eggs or something. And yes. What about those things? Because I always wondered when they when I read about the tissues that are found, cells or something, how are they preserved? I mean. So we're starting to find more and more skin on yeah. dinosaurs, or at least impressions of skin. Um, recently I was working on an Allosaurus, um, and as they were working on it, they started to see a pattern on some of the matrix around the skull. Mm. As we started looking at it, it really looks like a pattern of skin. And then we found skin on the neck, on the shoulder, on the side of the animal, on the legs. Um, it's not as beautiful as you might like it to be, mm -hmm. but it also comes with a residue. So the next thing that we're really chasing on this is possibly figuring out whether or not we can get at color. Yeah. We can't right now. No yeah. pigments, right? That would we can give you the color of feathers. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting, yeah. yeah. But we can't give you the color of leather yet. Yeah. And it's possible, it's possible. Just like our skin, you know, it's got melanin in it. Yeah. They have the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So how Figure. often how often does such findings change the way how we imagine some dinosaurs? Because for example, velociraptors we had in Jurassic Park and the real one are two different things. <laughs> totally different <laughs> yeah. things. Yeah, a, a lot of differences between those animals. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as we learn more, you know, some of the most iconic yeah. dinosaurs were the dinosaurs in, in Disney's Fantasia. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, that's that's the first time people saw dinosaurs moving around and reconstructed and fleshed out. That, you know, I mean, not absolutely, but by and large, most of the people in America General had audience. dinosaurs through that, through that movie. Mm -hmm. And it was horribly wrong, but beautiful. Yeah. And an amazing thing, bringing these things to life. You know, Jurassic Park was an amazing thing, bringing these things to life. You know, in some ways, the last installment of Jurassic Park did some really nice things and corrected a lot of things. But still, you know, there's always problems. Yeah, but uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not making a movie for paleontologists, but you're Absolutely. making, yeah, you're making a movie for us. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the things as Jurassic Park has gone on, remember, I know we're not supposed to talk about movies till later, but <laughs> when Jurassic Just... Park came out in 1993, nobody knew that dinosaurs had feathers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I read no that. evidence at all, right? Archaeopteryx has feathers, but dinosaurs don't. Yeah. So, so then two years later, we get the first hint of feathers. By the time we get into the middle of the series, we actually know that Velociraptor actually had feathers. Yeah. Because we have two, two animals trapped together in a fight. They're called the, the dueling dinosaurs. And it's Velociraptor fighting with Protoceratops. Velociraptor has its arms in the guts of Protoceratops. And then Protoceratops is grabbing his other arm. He's got his claws and its belly, but they died there together fighting as a sand dune collapsed in on them. Mm. Wow. But this bone right here on the edge of the arm of Velociraptor has little bumps going down the ulna. And those wow. are only for the attachment of flight feathers. So we actually know Velociraptor itself had long feathers on its arms, could not fly. Mm -hmm. but it has feathers. Isn't that the, what you just described amazing? I mean, for history to move its way, you know, if that didn't fall, if they didn't fight at that moment, perfect, you, you would never discover it, basically. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and we discovered it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, how many times did that happen, you know, back then? Mm, yeah. 0.001%. Yeah. 
and, and how many times do we find everything that happens? Way oh. even less, right? Mm, so phenomenal. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I feel so. I mean, the the other thing about Velociraptor is, you know, this is the skull of Velociraptor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had some work boots and a stick, you're probably not too afraid of this animal. <laughs> yeah. It's not the size that it is in Jurassic Park. Yeah. It's not the Terminators. <laughs> yeah, they're basically. No. So, I mean, this is its claw. I mean, it's big. You wouldn't want to get in close with that animal. But the same year that Jurassic Park came out, they found Utah Raptor here in Utah. Wow. And this is the size of the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park. So at some time, much earlier than Velociraptor, there actually was a raptor out there that was the size of those animals. Mm. Now, at the same time, it doesn't bother me that the raptors don't have feathers because it's an iconic character of a movie. Yeah, it's yeah. basically... I, I don't want them to make Velociraptor into this tiny thing that doesn't look anything like Velociraptor in the movie. Yeah, the, the character. Let's leave it alone. We got our feathers with Pyroraptor in the last movie, so yeah. it's all good. Yeah, basically, iconic villains of the cinema are Velociraptors. I mean, I was I was scared of them when I was little on the Jurassic Park. It was legendary, legendary. Yeah, and I have to ask, what are the chances to find fossils in our backyards? Did it happen? So it depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, For example, in Utah. So in Utah, where I live is at the bottom of a giant lake mm -hmm. that was here, you know, 12,000 years ago. So no, I'm going to have to dig really, really deep to get down to the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But if I lived 100 miles away in rural Utah, you know, it's definitely a possibility. It just depends on the rocks that you're built upon. Um, usually what people find in their backyards is something from the ice ages, a mammoth, or, you know, we have people who find, um, you know, bison-like animals and musk ox in their backyards here in our city. Well, cool as well. Yeah, I yeah. would like one. <laughs> <laughs> and are those people allowed uh, to keep them for personal collection or? So in the U.S., um, the person who owns the surface rights to the land owns the rights to the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So if it's on your private land, you own it. Um, but generally, um, people who own private land will subcontract with dinosaur diggers to, to take it out, or they'll donate it to a museum and let you know, a professional crew. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's really easy to destroy a dinosaur in the ground. Mm -hmm. It actually takes a lot of skill. You know, you can teach anybody to do it, but I have seen dinosaurs collected quickly in which you lose all kinds of information and lots of pieces of the bone by just trying to grab it out of the ground. Mm, so yeah. the slower you go, the better it is. Especially in the past, am I right? While the bone wars were the thing. I mean, one destroyed the fossils for another and things like that. Well, and here's a rib. Okay. <laughs> here's another rib. We know what ribs look like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was really, really bad. Uh, yeah. The fact that... And a lot of dynamite. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, dynamite can be fun. <laughs> but, uh, nice. but using dynamite to destroy the quarry so the next person can't look at it that's you know totally irresponsible and you know yeah be prime to science mm -hmm. yeah. and now well, let's speak about theories a little bit you know at the time the biggest rival to darwin was paleontology because of the lack of uh, fossil records and in the meantime it proved to be uh, his biggest ally for one of the most disputed theories, the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. And what is your opinion about it? Uh, who do you think had a more impact on each other, paleontology on Darwin or Darwin on paleontology? So even as a young kid in his 20s, Darwin was collecting fossils mm -hmm. in South America 
and sending them back to the British Museum under the tutelage of the guy who eventually named dinosaurs, Sir Richard Owen. Really? I didn't know that. So Sir Richard Owen was an amazing anatomist. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually worked together. Darwin actually named um, some extinct animals from South America after Owen and sent them back. Uh, Darwin made some of the first geologic maps. And all of this is literally at, at about the age of 23. So he's just this young punk on a boat, but he's yeah. seen data for the first time. I mean, one of the one of the biggest mistakes Darwin made is he went there and he recognized that the birds were different on each of the islands of the Galapagos. Mm. And that was awesome. Yeah. Right? But just like me as a student and my students today, he did not write down where each of the birds came from. Yeah. yeah. So he's got a collection of these birds at the British Museum. We know where they came from now. Yeah. But he it never occurred to him to write down which island it came from. He probably knew. But then he never wrote it down. So, you know, Darwin made all kinds of mistakes. But him looking at fossils and how fossils changed over time really made it clear to him that animals come and go. They go extinct, new animals arise. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, this fluorescence of life where animals come from a common ancestor and, and move out. This is something that Sir Richard Owen, who named dinosaurs in 1842, totally could not accept. Mm. And the two ended up being quite bitter enemies. So like the best paleontologist and scientist of the time, an amazing anatomist, just could not accept this idea of species changing over time and instead believed that they were specially created and somehow transported on Noah's Ark. Um, but, but yes, definitely. And one of the things that Darwin says in his original book, Origin of Species, which unfortunately never identifies what a species is, but that's another problem. Uh, but in the Origin of Species, he says, the, the best criticism for my arguments is the lack of transitional fossils. Mm -hmm. yeah. The very next year, they found a feather in dinosaur rocks. Nice. That was like yeah. And then 1861, they found the first specimen of Archaeopteryx. So he actually predicted that you should find transitional fossils between groups. Archaeopteryx was a good transitional fossil between reptiles and birds. I mean, it was a bird. It had flight feathers. It had wings. It could fly. But it had a long tail, it had teeth, it had separate bones at its feet, it had claws on its wings. So to them, that was a really good transitional fossil or missing link between birds and reptiles. Mm -hmm. But then it took us all the way really till 1969 to actually figure out that birds actually came from dinosaurs. I mean, there were some hints at first, but... People thought that birds were related to dinosaurs, but maybe not descended from. But uh, pterodactyl came after Archaeopteryx, am I right? So that's a different story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So pterosaurs, um, they're awesome. And pterosaurs... Of course you have one model. <laughs> I, I do, but they're not dinosaurs. No. They're absolutely not dinosaurs. No. You would get them in every plastic bag of toy dinosaurs. But a pterosaur evolved before or right at the same time as dinosaurs. And they share a common ancestor. Mm. So dinosaurs and dinosaur morphs and their group, their closest ancestors are the pterosaurs. But pterosaurs are outside of dinosaurs. They were almost likely warm-blooded. They have a very similar lung system and th things like that. But pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. So they start, we actually have older pterosaurs than we have dinosaurs. And they go all the way up to the end. And um, something happens to pterosaurs, all the ones that have long tails, 
disappear right when birds really start going crazy. Mm. So we think that birds evolved right around 160 million years ago. And by 130 million years ago, there were no pterosaurs with long tails. Mm. So maybe, you know, there's a correlation. And then pterosaurs eventually became giraffe-sized, living alongside T-Rex, and basically became so specialized that they, there was no way they were going to survive the, the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Oh, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. And if pterosaurs and dinosaurs are different species, what about marine dinosaurs, mosasaurus? Are they dinosaurs? They're not. So if you've heard of a Komodo dragon? Yeah, yeah. we heard. We love it. <laughs> I love that animal. <laughs> that is uh, a monitor lizard, like a rock iguana. And that's what a, that's what a mosasaur is. It's mm. a giant aquatic Komodo dragon. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> and the, the weird thing is they only lived at the end of the Cretaceous. Yeah. So, you know, dinosaurs are around for 200 million years, give or take. Just over. <laughs> yeah. And it's only in the last 25 million years that mosasaurs actually show up. So it's the long-necked, you know, ichthyosaurs, or sorry, plesiosaurs, you know, like the Loch Ness Monster, and the ones that look like dolphins, the ichthyosaurs, and some other ones. Those were the dominant sea monsters during the time of the dinosaurs. And we know that they ate and were eaten by sharks, but they for sure were the top of the food chain. Yeah. And there's no dinosaur that was fully aquatic like any of these animals. Yeah. Now, people are talking about Spinosaurus right now. Yeah. Um, Spinosaurus was certainly a fish eater by looking at the way its skull is built, and the way its teeth are built. Um, and it certainly could hang out in the water, but it didn't live, you know, it was something that lived on the shores and the seashore and could swim, but it's not what you would call a fully aquatic animal. You know, it didn't get rid of its arms and legs and become, you know, a tail swimmer. Yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, I just thought, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so prehistoric planet. So this is the newest, this is what they're thinking Spinosaurus looks like now. Mm, yeah. yeah, big thing. You know, we used to think about it as different. Jurassic I'm Park three. Hundred percent sure that its legs are really that short, but mm -hmm. it does have a big, long, flat tail, like this. I mean, the mm -hmm. sail. Each one of these is two meters long. Wow. You know, just each bone in the backbone is two meters long. It's a huge dinosaur. Yeah, um, but it's got this hugely narrow beak. Mm -hmm. you know, Something like eat, alligators? Yeah, no serrations. It looked like an alligator that eats fish today. Mm -hmm. So almost certainly it ate fish in the ocean, but shallow. Uh, but now that you, you, you're mentioning, uh, you know, the mosasaur and pterangosaur, they were a huge part of the docuseries uh, Prehistoric Planet on Apple+. Plus. I don't know if you watched it. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, oh. they were a huge part of, yeah. of it. And it was very well done. I mean, in terms of visuals, it was amazing. Uh, but now that you talk about it, you know, um, we see at the end of the first episode, I'm going to a little spoil for you. Uh, Tarangosaur, like, it's pregnant and it gives birth, but uh, it's like, it's not from the egg. Uh, did all uh, dinosaurs lay egg or no. was it my misconception? Yeah, so this is a problem. So again, uh, so what animal are we talking about? Uh, Tarangosaur. One with the long neck, undersea. Yeah, undersea. I don't, I don't know if I'm... Oh, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, so it's either an elasmosaur or a plesiosaur. Yeah, I can't pronounce it correctly. Don't, yeah, don't judge me. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's some obscure ones out there, right? And so when they make a film, you know, people get to, you know, some of the advisors want to pick one of their guys, you know. <laughs> no. Right, so the last guy who who did Jurassic Park, Steve Brissotti, he got some of his favorites um, into the movie here and there, um, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but again, so these animals are not dinosaurs. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right? No marine reptile is a dinosaur. And amongst the marine reptiles, there are three major groups. There's one group that includes the ple- the long-necked plesiosaurs. Yeah. And then they also have the short-necked pliosaurs. And then there's the mosasaurs, which are famous from Jurassic World. Yeah. Then yeah. there is um, the ichthyosaurs that look like dolphins. Mm-hmm. Across those animals, there's actually a variety of different birth strategies. So just like in snakes, some snakes give live birth. Yeah. But they still have eggs. The baby snake comes out of the egg inside the mother's body. Mm. And so this is definitely a possibility for some of the marine reptiles. And a study actually just came out in which, you know, the difference between a bird egg and a turtle egg. You know the difference? Mm. Yeah. A turtle egg is leathery. And oh, soft. yeah. And a bird egg is hard and calcinated. Mm, yeah. So many of these marine reptiles, and I would say all, have soft eggs like turtles. And so we actually have one egg um, from, I, I believe it's a plesiosaur, but it could be a mosasaur. Um, so you have the soft egg that the animal came out of. So, you know, it's a combination of are you laying eggs like a turtle? Or are you hatching the eggs inside your body and letting the the animals come out? Mm -hmm. Now, some of these animals could get up on land. Like a mosasaur and a plesiosaur probably could get up on land. Mm -hmm. So there's there's talk, you know, did they have a reproductive strategy where they laid eggs like turtles? But things like... On the beach. Yeah. 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 On an island somewhere, you know, no dinosaur can get to it. I guess all you have to worry about is pterosaurs. In birds, but um, we do know that the ones that look like dolphins and sharks, the ichthyosaurs, they are giving live birth and the pups are coming out. Hmm. And we have, there's a famous one at one of the museums where the pup is stuck hanging outside of the mother and the mother and the pup died and fell. Hmm. Keep in mind, all these groups of animals have to breathe every, I don't know, 20 minutes at yeah. least. So, you know, that's a problem. And that pup actually came out backwards because what we found in other pterosaurs is the pups, I can't make my hand do that, but the pups yeah. actually swim out. Mm, yeah. So there's like four pups from, from Ichthyosaur and they swim yeah, out, first. go up to the, to the surface and take a breath and start their life, of, you know eating fish something like that was in the in the in prehistoric the, yeah prehistoric plant. i mean yeah uh, the yeah. long it was the long neck like you spoke it gave live birth and it immediately swam to the uh to breathe Surface. air yeah right. and you saw in the trailer if you watch the trailer that t-rex is swimming so how possible was for t-rex to swim so i haven't met an animal that can't swim really yeah mm, yeah I mean, okay, maybe some land tortoises have a difficult time, but you know, elephants can swim, hippos can swim. You know, elephants, hippos literally swam across the Mozambique Channel, which is 400 miles. Yeah, amazing. Um, relatively recently and got to Madagascar from Africa, or they wrapped it on a, some floating vegetation or whatever, but they, they made it. Um, hippos can swim real well. Elephants can swim real, real well. I'm sure dinosaurs could swim real well, too. We, we know that meat-eating dinosaurs actually did swim. Um, we have a track site in Utah filled with hundreds and hundreds of tracks, but you'll get, like, you know, the toes scraping. You know, he's floating, yeah. but you'll get the, the toes, like, helping him, you know, just like you've been in a pool as a kid. You know, you're almost yeah. tall enough to breathe, but not quite. So yeah. You know, you're doing that kind of thing. Dinosaurs were doing that too. So, sure. I mean, definitely T-Rex is a, is a giant ball of air sacs. It's actually less dense than you would think. And it would float. And and we actually find dead dinosaurs floating out to sea and going a long ways. Like two or three hundred miles away from the coast, we'll find, we'll find dinosaurs. 
Yeah, but uh, how how now that you mentioned it, how uh, different is the process from getting maybe fossils from the if you can find them uh, for the marine dinosaurs or like uh, water type. Now you said that they are armed dinosaurs, but those kind of animals from the uh, yeah uh, uh, land. Yeah, so uh, I, I can think of five dinosaurs that have been found in ocean rocks, mm. and they've all been found by people looking for sea monsters. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So the last place I'm ever going to go to look for dinosaurs is marine rocks. Doesn't mean they're not there, mm -hmm. you know, but my chances are best if I'm looking in land rocks, river rocks, lake rocks. Yeah. If I want to find a dinosaur, I want to find it in lake rocks because that's where, you know, all those amazing feathered dinosaurs and mammals with fur and places that were getting color from feathers. Those are from a series of lakes uh, between Korea and China, in China, and fine sediment is falling down to the bottom of those lakes and preserving them, and we can actually figure out what they look like. Mm. So rapid burial in really, really fine-grained sediments is the best way to preserve fossils. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have one friend's question that connects to that, because he said, we need a specific uh, environment to preserve the fossil and conditions. And are there some species that existed, but we will never find? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, th this, is one of the well, this is one of the problems with Jurassic Park. You know, paleontologists and not me, somebody has gone out there and calculated that we have found 0.001% of the dinosaurs that existed. Mm -hmm. I would say it's much lower than that. Right? You got 240 million years. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. No, uh, 180 million years of dinosaur time. And we have huge gaps in which we haven't found anything. At any given time, there's probably 20 different dinosaurs living in any given location. You know, the hilarious thing is in Jurassic Park, you know, they go and they get the amber and they get the mosquito. And those mosquitoes only bit dinosaurs that you've heard of. Yeah. <laughs> but right? could they bit them all because they have the hard uh, skin and everything? Yeah, but I mean, they bit Ankylosaurus. <laughs> Nothing has harder skin than that. You know, they yeah. bit Brachiosaurus. So, I mean, I get it. You know, you wouldn't want to... You know, they, they brought in weird new dinosaurs and called it genetic engineering. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the chances of you getting T-Rex and Stegosaurus, yeah. and Dilophosaurus, you, you know, all from your mine in Costa Rica. Yeah, uh, no. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, you know, that explanation worked perfectly for me as a kid. Yeah. yeah. To be honest. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, the, I was always fascinated by, you know, you can stop the frame in the VCR and you can see all the different dinosaurs that they had in Jurassic Park 1, mm -hmm. but they don't show you. Yeah. yeah. You know, so like Allosaurus, which is one of my favorite dinosaurs, is in there, but we never saw it. Stegosaurus was in there, we never saw it. Mm, so yeah. They had to wait to the sequels. Yeah. And we, 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 as a kid, we, we heard about the meteorite strike and uh, extinction. So in my imagination, it was just a big rock, just like moon. He, it, One day it hit and everything went to shit. Yeah. <laughs> that was, but, <laughs> but it's not like that. What's the reality? Well, it is. Well, I mean... Was okay. it a no, multiple I, shots? No, yeah. it was one shot. But, you know, I live in America. So, you know, Americans have a, an America-centric view of the world, right? Yeah. But if you're a dinosaur living in America, it was a really nice day. And then everything fades to white. You're on, yeah. A real bright light, and you burn up and don't even know it. Yeah. You know, the ring of fire went all the way into Canada, mm -hmm. burning everything. You know, and within a few hours, you've got this rain of molten pieces of rock coming down. Um, yeah, it was really, really bad here. So almost immediately, 
it devastated all the dinosaurs living in North America. Mm -hmm. And within eight hours later, you know, the temperature on the other side of the world got to 200 degrees. That's just the ambient temperature. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some things lived, but they're small and they're generalists. And maybe they were hiding in a burrow or behind a tree. Um, cockroaches. Yeah. Cockroaches <laughs> survive anything. Yeah. And mam mammals. Yeah. <laughs> indestructible uh but yeah uh, i'm actually glad that i heard you confirm it that just fell and everything went <laughs> you know yeah. i mean th there's a great quote in a new book and it's like you know basically the entire asteroid was about the size of from the earth to where airplanes cruise at altitude thirty-three thousand mm. feet oh. you know across yeah so it enters the atmosphere it pulls a vacuum of space all the way down to the ground you know it ejects chunks of everything into the atmosphere there are pieces of dinosaur on the moon for sure mm. you know oh that's that, that's an interesting thought actually yeah <laughs> yeah, I yeah just... some local dinosaurs on the moon and you'll catch that mm, yeah. Uh, yeah catch that quote but yeah it's just you know it's it's not like in armageddon where, you know, there's a slow, lazy charcoal briquette coming across the sky. It was like zap, boom, light, over. Yeah. We had two continents at the time, right? Or more? No. I mean, so we had what we call Laurasia. Yeah. yeah. And Gondwana, right? We had Gondwana, but both Antarctica and Australia and India had split off from Gondwana and were separate. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, so India is on its way to the to the Asia, you know, to create the um, Himalayans. But yeah, it's an island by then. Yeah. Uh, the, because it's I can volcanoes, right? India yeah. is just an oozing plateau of, of volcanic lava. Yeah, the, uh, their geography. Country. Isn't the great the greatest <laughs> one definitely, and I have a little speculation now because you said all dinosaurs could swim, but not for long distances, right? But the distance between today's North America and Asia on, on the Russian part was close. Am I right? Is it possible for some species to cross between the continents? They, they walked. They walked. So at times, dinosaurs walked across the Bering Strait. Really just like people did, you know, at some time, you know, now we know that people walked across the Bering Strait right about 14,000 years ago. Yeah. yeah. But they probably went earlier because now we're starting to find good evidence that people were on North America at 28 and 23,000 years ago. Mm, yeah. Way too early, you know, 10 years ago, no one would have believed this, but it's, yeah. it's solid now. Yeah. We, we, we basically, you know, hearing you speak, I always remember how actually we know a little about our species, let alone dinosaurs. About our species, we know so little. It's, it's yeah. kind of frustrating, you know? We know so little about anything. Yeah. Right? We, we think we know everything, but, you know, next year we're going to learn something different. Yeah. yeah, yeah the, and... the amazing thing is just, you know, I've, I've been teaching, you know, science and cinema type classes you know, since about 2000. And, you know, we would talk about climate change and everyone just roll their eyes and not believe it. But I, I would say 98% of students accept that the world is warming and it has something to do with humans. And I think we're actually getting to a place where we couldn't have even predicted where things were going 20 years later in, 20, in 2000. The things that are happening this year because of climate change are so far beyond even the craziest screaming radical scientists out there talking about climate change. Um, it's pretty amazing. So this is something we're going to get to watch. We're going to get to watch the destruction of our world in slow motion compared to the dinosaurs instantaneously yeah. losing theirs. Or if we drop a couple of nukes, you know, it's going to be... It's a yeah. even faster. Yeah. yeah. Well, that might give us some cooling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But like, runs enough stuff under the atmosphere. Now we have a. Now we have a blanket. Yeah. 
But it also can go back to it can actually be hothouse. Mm, yeah, so we'll see. Unclear how how global nuclear war uh, will affect us. So <laughs> nuclear winter, hothouse nuclear blanket. It's it's actually tough. Yeah, everybody wins. <laughs> everybody wins. <laughs> you're a cockroach. <laughs> yeah, if you're a cockroach. Yeah, uh, they're gonna outlive us and, and aliens. And well, like Doctor Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Yeah. What can I life say? finds a way. Yeah, and I mean, but at but, some point, eight billion years from now, hmm. the Earth will be inside the Sun's orbit. Yeah. yeah. So we have eight billion years to figure out how life is going to. Uh, get off this planet. Now we can ask, is that a good idea? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't think anyone knows. Yeah. But th that's not the kind of questions that people generally think about this. Uh, <laughs> but speaking about climate changes, I mean, climate change would happen even if people uh, weren't here, but just a few billion years later, in my way. Because we had ice ages and everything. Climate's change. Climate's definitely changed. Yeah. We've gone back and forth for the last 200,000 years. But the get the support is, it. <laughs> we should be getting colder. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but instead, we're going the other way. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> and in well, speaking about pop culture oh, and movies. Trust property? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe just rent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that's in a real Don't estate. Don't make long-term investments in beachfront <laughs> property. No, and not in Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> and speaking about pop culture uh, and Jurassic Park world, it's all about genetics, recreating the dinosaurs, re-extincting them. And we have this news that uh, I think some Russian scientists are working to revive the mammoths. Of course, they're Russians. <laughs> of course, yeah. So, so the mammoths came from Russia. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. All the way to yeah. Egypt. Oh, yeah. So, so um, there's basically vast surfaces of permafrost mm -hmm. in, you know, like north of Kamchatka in Siberia. And now that it's illegal to buy and sell ivory from elephants, Mm, yeah, the new ivory is mammoth ivory. That's yeah. legal to sell. Mammoth. And there's a huge market for ivory. Yeah. yeah. Um, so people are taking these giant cut tusks, and you know, the Chinese are carving them into carved tusks, and you know, they sell for tens of millions of dollars, one two. Didn't know that. Um, but at the same time, um, just this year, so obviously they find recently unfrozen mammals with flesh mm -hmm. you know they, they found a wolf with all of its fur rotting mm, you know? yeah. it's like a recent wolf and it's fourteen thousand years old um but recent, they just found another mammoth in alaska in the same sort of conditions yeah i read about it soft tissue on the riverbank right yeah yeah so people have been working on this um so it's interesting um believe it or not we can Right now, we can only clone mammals. Hmm. We can't clone reptiles, insects, birds. We can only clone mammals. So, how do you, how, you know, it just has to do with how you get the information into an embryo and then that embryo into an egg, you know, which we don't have to do with mammals. So, we take the embryo from a mammal created in a lab, you know, basically they take the center of a cell out and they put the DNA from another cell mm -hmm. and then it starts growing up into you know, an embryo. Then they implant it. So to do it with a mammoth, you have to take the closest elephant species to a mammoth and implant that and then hope that that mother elephant can take that to term and hope the gestation period is close enough that you can then produce a baby mammoth. Mm. Turns out the closest relative, closest living relative to a mammoth is the Asian elephant. Yeah. So that's the plan. And so that's what people are working on, uh, but they haven't got there. I expect they will get there in our lifetime. Yeah. But they will have a clone of one mammoth. They will not bring back an entire species, right? 
it'll be a hairy African elephant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but you know what? Uh, it'll be cool. I can't wait to see. Yeah, uh, me too. If uh, you know they put it in zoo, I will definitely visit. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know. Obviously, we mentioned Jurassic Park multiple, multiple times. It's one of my favorite movies, personally, ever. Uh, uh, but uh, what are what are your? Is it that maybe your also favorite movie of the dinosaurs, or do you have some you know other that uh, uh, are you a fan of particular? So for me, two shows are really foundational. Um, I mean, obviously, Jurassic Park. Obviously. It's an amazing movie. Um, it's the first time we really saw dinosaurs come to life. And it's a decent jump scare horror movie. Walking with Dinosaurs was really important too because it it also was the first time you treated dinosaurs like they were in one of these Richard Attenborough nature shows. Mm-hmm. So so that was really good. And both of those had a lot of a lot of effect on many up and coming paleontologists and scientists. But you know, I yeah. like all yeah. dinosaur movies, even the even the horrible ones. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's a one uh, there's an animated movie that actually Spielberg and Lucas produced. It was called uh, Land Before Time. Uh, yeah. In 19, uh, in 1988, it was it was one of my favorite movies as a child. You know, it was amazing. Yeah, and, and I love Disney's The Dinosaur. Uh, uh, from, from 2000, yeah, from 2000, yeah, yeah that's, classic. That's a great one, you know, with the computer 3D animation. It was, yeah. Well, and, and now there's Primal. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard of that. No, 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 no I didn't. Oh, it's on HBO, and I love it, but it's a story about dinosaurs and cavemen, so I've oh. got that problem with it. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. They, they did, but, it's but it's very gory and it's awesome. You know, as far yeah. as animation goes, I definitely recommend people to look up primal mm, yeah they didn't meet no. <laughs> or, or on the noah's ark as the christians would <laughs> yeah unfortunately speaking about misconceptions uh in jurassic park that uh, sam neil's famous slide don't move when t-rex is around so oops <laughs> ellie is... and dr sadler just got eight yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. so it's a bullshit yeah. it, i mean you can't see it very well in this cast, but mm-hmm. this dinosaur can look you in the eyes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Here's one eye, here's the other eye up here. And it can see you with overlapping field of vision and binocular vision. Even if it sees in black and white, it can see you. Yeah. Right? And the difference between this dinosaur and other tyrannosaurs is they didn't have that. So some of the best vision is actually in T Rex. You know, this is a one-fifth scale copy of T-Rex, um, mm. the one that just sold for $32 million. Wow. Um, so, so imagine this animal, you know, expanded to five times. That's what T-Rex is like. Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing animal. But, yeah, I'm I'm certainly not taking my chances with Don't Move. Yeah. You know? But one of the things that I – I mean, it happens in basically all, all the movies – and again, I get it, uh, but you know when predator, predators attack in the, in the movies, they usually scream like they roar before they attack. Now, why would they do that? <laughs> actually, so I, I actually have two hybrid cats. Um, so I have house cats that are hybridized with um, the African serval, which is a wild cat that lives in the plains. These are they're big cats, like thirty pounds, but. Being small cats out on the savanna, they totally fight and attack silently. Yeah. So you'll hear things knocking over and you'll see these two cats fighting. But like making noise is not what animals do. Like if you go to the savannas in, Af- in Africa and watch lions take out uh, gazelles or yeah. zebras, you know, they'll scream literally. <laughs> but, you know, the predators are not making that noise. Logically. Yeah. And speaking about it, I, there's this pop culture famous battle between Triceratops and T-Rex. And T-Rex always wins. Is it possible for Triceratops once as an underdog to win against the T-Rex? Yes. 
Um, so <laughs> my yeah. favorite. So there's another. So there's another fighting dinosaurs specimen. Right. So the fighting dinosaurs are those two, you know, Velociraptor versus um, Protoceratops. Mm -hmm. But um, recently, a specimen of maybe T. Rex and Triceratops came up for sale in Montana, and it's actually been sold to a museum, and we'll hear more about it later. But this was billed as two animals fighting and both dying together. So I've seen it. It looks like the skull of the Tyrannosaur is crushed. Mm. Its teeth are broken off. And its teeth are in the tail of the Triceratops. So just totally arm waving. And, you know, we'll have to wait for the actual study to come out. But here's a scenario that was painted by the people who owned it as they were trying to sell it. There's a sick Triceratops out there. The young T-Rex comes over, bites it in the tail. The Triceratops kicks it in the face. And they both lay there in debt. Right? Oh. They're, they're both dead together. And then we're slowly covered by sediments later. But we'll have to wait for that one. So some museum somewhere out there has that and will actually tell us what happened. But yeah, I mean, listen, it's David and Goliath. Yeah. David wins, you know, almost all the time. But so a lot of times Goliath wins too. Yeah. A shot to the temple would help. Yeah. <laughs> and about... it just doesn't make for a good story when Goliath wins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, T-Rex is considered to be the king of dinosaurs in pop culture, yeah. and lion is the king of the jungle. Could pack of lions bring the T-Rex down? No. No. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't even try. Now, of course, if T-Rex is laying on the ground and it's sick, sure. Yeah. You know, but what's interesting is. A pack of lions will kill a zebra yeah. in the night. And then the next morning, a pack of hyenas will chase the lions off of it. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there's there's king and there's, you know, a lion is the king in the jungle. T-Rex could beat any other dinosaur in its world. And if it time traveled, I don't think there's any dinosaur that, that could beat it. Not even Gigan Giganotosaurus. Yeah. 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 So, so we always learned it Giganotosaurus. In the movie, they're calling it Giganotosaurus, which <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, but anyway, T Rex has huge, crushing jaws. Mm -hmm. It's got no arms because it uses its head to bite things apart and crush things. We actually have poop that we think is from T-Rex. Wow. You know, it's like, let's see, it is two or three feet long, about that big round, like a big loaf of bread, chock full of chunks of bone. Wow. T-Rex doesn't chew its food. Just devour. It chops it into pieces that it can swallow, and then its digestive juices break that down. Wow. So in the end, there's this slurry of sand that it's pooping out, and that sand are chunks of the things oh. that see. Ian Malcolm comes in and says, that is one big pile of shit. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> oh, this, this was maybe... Ian Malcolm is the hero of the entire series. Yeah. Basically. Uh, yeah. Only reasonable guy in the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the last installment of Jurassic World. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 And my favorite is uh, Dr. Alan Grant is digging for dinosaurs mm -hmm. in Utah in a cave in the Permian where there are no dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was maybe uh, the, the most interesting yeah. one and a half hour we had on this podcast, yeah. to be honest. And, my pleasure yeah and for the end we have this little tradition where we read quote on our language and we translate it to the english we are from the montenegro it's a little country in the mediterranean i don't know if you heard from it 
and oh. we yeah. and we had our uh, bishop and ruler of the Montenegro 200 years ago, Petr II Petrovic Njegoš. And his quote on our language would be like, pokoljenje za pjesmu stvoreno, vile će se grabiti o vjekove da vam vjence dostojne saprati. And on English, something similar would be a generation created for the song, the fairies will grab for the ages to make your writs worthy of tripping. So, we don't know about history. Every, everyone will fight for its place in history, and we just have to learn it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. That was it for today. Do you have maybe some message for our listeners, your students, future paleontologists, uh, to share with them? When I started digging up dinosaurs, I saw all the dinosaurs that people have dug up. And I was morose and sad because I felt like all the good stuff had already been found. I guarantee you that is not the case. There are many, many dinosaurs in the ground that still have yet to be discovered. And we have not even scratched the surface yet. So there is hope. There are more dinosaurs. There's much more to learn. And it's a lot of fun going down that road. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Thank you for the opportunity. Doors are open for you to come back for another episode next season. My pleasure. Be happy to. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Bye, everyone. <laughs>